So I'm a, an architect at uh, Dremio, and formerly I was at Twitter uh, as a tech lead, and uh, that's where we created uh, Parquet in collaboration with um, Cladera. At the time, uh, you know, we had uh, Vertica, which is a good uh, database, distributed database, and Hadoop. And Vertica scale doesn't scale as much as Hadoop, but Hadoop. Uh, is not as responsive as Vertica, so the idea was to make Hadoop more of a um, database and less of a file system. So it's kind of the premise to Parquet. I'm also an Apache member, and uh, right now I've been contributed to Euro, uh, Parquet, and I'm also on the incubator in uh, Peak PMC. So today I'll start with talking about, you know, how to build community-driven standards like Parquet and Euro. Um, the importance of interoperability and to build an ecosystem because it's not only about building cool technology or having something that's efficient for a particular task. It's also about how you make all those things work together, right? You don't just have a bunch of libraries that you can use. It's also about having all those tools and systems working together well. And so in particular for Parquet and Euro, I'll talk about the benefits of columnar representation, explain the why we do it that way, and then I'll talk about the future and what we're headed to. So first, I'll talk about um, the community-driven standard. How do we get there? So when we started Parquet, um, there was a common need for a columnar format, a good columnar format for Hadoop stuff and not necessarily only Hadoop, but all the big data ecosystem that goes with it. And some people are using it without HDFS uh, or in S3 or other distributed file system. And so we started looking into it and I was looking at the Dremel paper and trying to implement some of the uh, kind of high level details that are not very explained uh, in the paper. and. Um, and at the time, we didn't really want this to be a proprietary format, right? It was not very good. It's good to have good technology, but then if you have to integrate it with every single thing you're going to use, it's going to be a huge cost. So we started, I was at Twitter at the time, so I started tweeting about it. I still tweet, um, but you know, it was good motivation to start that way. And we connected with the um, Impala team at the time from Cloud Air. And themselves, they were looking for a, a good columnar format and they were starting experimenting. So I had a prototype, they had the prototype. So we met and we put our effort together and that was good because I was starting something that was more a community. It was not just one company, it was more than one and we we're kind of starting building a consensus on how this should work. And we were br bringing more of a Java side of uh, seeing things and they were implementing C++ native code. So they were bringing the C++ side of things, of seeing things. And we were trying to build a database from the ground up, right? We were looking at the format first and they were building a query engine. So they were bringing also like actual integration with, with the query engine from the start. So that was a good, you know, working together. That was a good start. And so we started collaborating on making Parquet. And then as, and starting to talk about it and do all this, and at some point, you know, other teams started talk with us. So the drill team came and one of the important point was to be very open and very welcoming to other people to say, hey, what do you need? Oh, you have this use case. We need those types and integrate that into the spec. And it's a difficult balance because you want to support like other people's use case, but as a standard format, you don't want to add too many bells and whistles because the more complex it is, the more things there are in it, the less likely it is to be like widely adopted. And it started from that, so like Impala used it, and then Drill used it, and then the Spark people started using it. So Spark SQL uses Parquet as well as its native, most efficient format, and they, uh, they didn't even contact us, right? they just did it. And then at that point, it started spreading, and it became like a de facto standard for columnar format. So it's amazing. I mean, I work hard to kind of try to evangelize, evangelize and make it work, but it really did work. And it's a good, you know, it's a combination of multiple factors. The fact that there was a need for it at the time, 
and also being open and just reasonably good code as well. Um, and that's important too. And, you know, and it kind of build its community that way, starting from those two companies and like two products working on it. And so Parquet is a um, disk-based um, columnar format. And for Euro, we want to build on that success and uh, enable a memory-based columnar format. <coughs> so the goal is to share the effort, create an ecosystem. So it's just like not have one group of people build all the integrations, because then they can happen in parallel in all of those teams. Uh, and also, you know, create the ecosystem because then once you reach a critical mass, then like it becomes natural things, right? We just, everybody's going to reuse it. And so it's really important to be started from the start and, um, you know, build, build this consensus and make sure um, to be inclusive, but also be able to keep things simple and not have too many things in it. So for the Apache Aero project, um, we started by, um, it includes uh, PMC members from all those projects. Not all those projects are Apache project, but most are. So in the PMC for, if you're not familiar with how Apache works, um, the PMC is a project management committee. So basically the people on the PMC, uh, they can decide who is going to become a committer. There's a vote, and you're like, this person is worthy, or like has proven that they provide good contribution of, they have good input, and we want to make them a committer, and, um, or new PMC members. So it's kind of like the root, the people who oversee, hey, how do we build that community? And then when you're a committer, your main responsibility is getting other people's code in it, in the, in the source, in the code base. So we started by making sure we evolved people from all those projects, which are, you can see, storage layers like, like Kudu or HBase or Cassandra, or a more execution engine um, <clears throat> like Drill, Impala, uh, Spark, uh, Storm, and uh, R, and uh, Pandas on the Python side. So it was really important to make sure we kind of include um, feedback from these people and make sure we get on an agreement on the format, and enable things. And the reason these people got together is not just because, hey, let's have a beer or something, right? Because there's the, um, the whole in-memory uh, columnar representation is coming from research. So if we look at the Monet DB papers and the state of the art of database execution, this is where all those query execution is going to go faster. So, and I'll go into the details of why uh, columnar is faster. And so those are a few quotes, you don't have to read them, but basically taking from various project and, and they're basically stating how they're moving to columnar. So we just, it's not the project that's driving moving, people moving to columnar. It's actually all those query engines are moving to columnar execution to vectorize the execution because it goes faster. And the idea of the project A, Wait a minute, if we can agree on the format, the in-memory representation, there are a lot of benefits coming from having a common standard representation. And I'll go into details of that. So you've seen that similar representation in uh, Wes' uh, slides earlier about Arrow. So before, you know, every integration requires, hey, we need a custom integration between those two projects. We need um, serialization, deserialization. We need to agree on what the common protocol or format is going to be. And that's a lot of duplication of effort. And, you know, they all have different bugs. On the other hand, if we agree on what the format is, what the handshake is, all that stuff, um, then it becomes a much simpler thing. And once you integrate it with the standard, then you integrate with everybody who integrates a standard. Um, and so, an important part is to agree on a certain, what are the specifics of the format? Because it's not just, it's not just standard, it has to be efficient for that particular task of doing data analytics. <clears throat> and so one of the key things is, when you do all those integrations, often you have 
formats in between two systems that are the lowest common denominator, right? It's just whatever is in common, like when you do Python to Java, and there's a lot of overhead of serialization, deserialization. Like currently in PySpark, there's a lot of overhead in sending the data across processes and converting from one to the other. But if we agree on the format and it's in the in-memory representation, then there's no serialization, deserialization. Right? We just share the memory, it's much more efficient. And so that's where I'm going to go in the details of what is an efficient uh, representation in memory for data analytics. And that's where it's based on all the vectorization, uh, vectorized execution research. Um, you can look, look up things like MoneyDB and such. <coughs> So I'll talk a little bit about columnar formats. Sorry, I'm very old school. My GIF is not animated. Uh, I don't know if uh, the presenter from uh, BuzzFeed is here, but that was pretty cool, animated GIF. Uh, so, you know, columnar layout 101. Uh, so when we think of a table, so you have a table here, it's two-dimensional, but we are going to put it on a binary media that is one-dimensional, right? Whether you put it on disk or in memory, it's a list of values, right? It's one-dimensional. So you're going to have to put it either one row at a time or one column at a time. So traditionally, the simple way of doing it, you put it one row at a time and you actually interleave uh, values from different columns. So let's say if column A is a string, column B is an int, and column C is a date, you're going to interleave a string, an int, a date, a string, an int, a date, date. And if you do columnar representation, well, you're going to put all the strings together, all the integers together, and all the dates together. And then brings a lot of room for optimizations because let's say you say know something about your integers that they're smaller than 10, for example. Then that means you actually need uh, five bits uh, to encode each integers, right? And because you encode a bunch of integers together, you can just store them in a much more compact way. But if you interleave uh, strings and ints and things, then it becomes much harder to interleave things because you put a string and you have something that takes a few bits and maybe you put a date that has different characteristics behind. And also when you use a compression, uh, like more brute force compression algorithm, like uh, Snappy or um, LZO or GZIP or whatever your favorite compression, it's also going to be more efficient because you put together all the things that are similar, right? So it's going to, work better just because you put together things. <clears throat> and then when you access data, it's going to be much more efficient because when you, when you create it, so here I have three columns, but typically you have dozens, hundreds of columns, maybe thousands if you're crazy, you see that. And but usually when you query the data, you access only a subset of the columns. So that's where when you read only, let's say column B, it's going to be much more efficient to go to the column B, read all the Bs, and not even look at the other ones. When in the first case, uh, you would read the first B, do a small seek, do, read the second B, and so on, right? You do a lot of seeks, and as of scanning the data, it's relatively almost the same as reading everything, right? You can't really make it faster by reading only the tiny bits you need, but if you access a big, like a range at a time, only the Bs, then it's going to be a lot more efficient. So another aspect, so probably some people will think, hey, why didn't you just put Parquet in memory? Why did you need another format? Well, the trade-offs are different, right? You, the design decisions have slightly different trade-offs. When you're on disk, it's storage, you write in once and you're doing to, going to do a lot of queries on it. And there's a priority to IO reduction. You want to reduce IO more than you want to reduce CPU. It still has to be fast, right? If it's too CPU angry, then it's not gonna work, but you want to reduce um, IO more than CPU. And it's going to be mostly streaming access, so you're doing scans on a lot of data. In memory, it's more transient, right? It's being materialized for a specific task, so it could be executing a query, could be doing something else, but you load it once in memory, you do what you have to do with it, and then you throw it away. Um, so there's less of this pattern of we accessing 
a subset of the column. And the priority will be much more to CPU throughput because we're in memory, right? So we're not, there's less of this IO bottleneck of accessing uh, persistent storage. And there are also a lot more use cases when we actually need random access and being able to um, access individual records in constant time. So um, a little bit about the details of Parquet. So Parquet supports nested data structure. Um, <coughs> it's a compact format. Um, it has type aware encodings like bit packing or dictionary encoding, uh, which basically, because when we, we know the type of each column, so we can use a much better encodings to compress that in a very efficient way. If you think of dictionary encoding, it's replacing every value with an ID, an int, coming from a dictionary you built of all the distinct values. So if you have a reasonably small uh, cardinality on this column, a small number of distinct values, then you're going to be able to compress a lot and using very little CPU. Because then decompression is just a lookup in a table that is indexed, right? It's directly give me the ID, the value for this ID, and it's constant time access. So it's extremely, it's good at compressing and it's extremely fast at decoding compared to a more brute force algorithm like gzip that takes a bunch of bytes and tries to find repetition in it without knowing anything about record boundaries or things like that. Um, <clears throat> and it also does optimize IO. Uh, so projection pushdown and filtering pushdown. Projection pushdown is I want only those columns I need. And filter pushdown is based on statistics. So the, the files internally are partitions in raw groups, raw groups, and we keep statistics of min max for each column per row group. So when you access the data, you can really access, the goal is to minimize IO to the minimum, to minimize IO to only what you need. And so, you know, projection push down, we keep only the column we, we want, uh, statistics provide predicate pushdown, filter pushdowns, and you can keep only rows or at least partitions of rows that you want using uh, min max. So especially if your data is sorted, it's going to be very efficient. And then you read only the data you need. And um, I cheated a little bit because I told you uh, Parquet support nested data structures and I had only examples with flat data structures. So if you want to read the details of how Parquet uh, converts nested, nested data structure in a flat columnar representation. There's this blog post I wrote with all the details. And the general idea, idea is um, if you want to st store nulls, you would use one bit for, in value, for each value saying is it null or is it defined. And so the way you store nesting is instead of storing just one bit, you will store uh, an integer which says at which level in the tree it is null. Because obviously, if one level is a tree is null, then everything below is null as well. So just at one depth for each column, is it null, is enough to keep information of whether the field is null at what level. And because those are small integers, we can use the bit packing trick I was talking about before, and it's very small information. So a little bit about Euro now. <clears throat> so similar ID. Euro is well documented uh, format from the beginning, meaning it's not the spec is not defined by you provide the name of the Java class to use and that's your spec and if you want to know what the actual binary format, you look at the code. It's uh, actually well defined and the goal is is cross language compatible. You have a C++ implementation you have a Java implementation for accessing. And the purpose of that is just like Parquet can be read by uh, Impala or other C++ and written by other C++ systems or Java and they're all interoperable. And that way you open up all of your options, right? You can read Parquet from Python, uh, you can write it from Python and uh, you can read it from uh, Spark or uh, drill or your favorite um, Java-based SQL engine. So same ID for Arrow. It's designed to take advantage of modern CPU characteristics, and I'm going to go in the detail of that. And it's embeddable in execution engine, storage layers, etc. And the goal is to make all those so things interoperable easily. 
<clears throat> and just like Parquet, um, it uh, supports nested data structures uh, in a different way because it's optimized for a random access as well. And uh, we'll go in the details of what pipelining, CMD, and cache locality, um, how they work in the modern uh, CPUs and why it's important. And they enable scatter gather IO. Because the ID, because we standardize the in memory representation, when you send over the wire on the network your data structures, you can just tell um, the network interface hey, grab those buffers. Look, there's column A here, column B here, column C here. Put all those things on the network, and it's just going to directly send those buffers to the network. And on the other side, you can say, hey, take those buffers, put them in memory and you have a little bit of metadata around to say, hey, the length of the buffers, and there's no serialization, deserialization. All you're doing is sending your buffers on the wire, reading them back in memory. There's no transformation that is CPU angry, like you know, what happens when you use your language serialization, deserialization, uh, like turning into Java objects or Python objects, right? Because the raw uh, binary representation in memory is the same as on the wire. And that's very important because a lot of the time is spent in serialization, deserialization in CPU. So pipelining, if you think of, I'm talking about modern CPUs, uh, so we think of CPUs processors as executing one instruction after the other. And it's not been working like that for a long time. Uh, what uh, CPUs are doing, they're trying to, um, because, you know, same thing, uh, a processor is an area with different parts in it, right? And um, when you're using part of it, yeah, another part of it could be doing something else. So it can actually do some things in parallel. But it's still clock based of doing things one after the other. So what it's doing, it's trying to, it starts the next instruction before the previous one is finished. So executing an instruction is split in a pipeline and it goes through different steps of that pipeline. So here I have an imaginary four step Pipeline, I think it's more like a dozen steps. It depends a lot on what uh, processor it is. And so if it's starting the next instruction before the previous one is finished, um, there are different things that can happen. So what next instruction to execute could depend on the previous execution being finished. Let's like, think you have an if this is true, then do that, otherwise do this, or a loop, which basically is my loop done and I continue below or I go back to the beginning of the loop and do again. Or if you have a virtual call, like you have a function and depending on the type of the object I'm calling the function on, going to jump to a different place. Um, so those are all things that are data dependent, right? What I'm going to do depends on something to be executed before. So what the CPU has, there's a branch prediction mechanism. It says, hey, I'm going to try to guess what the next instruction is because I don't know yet because I have to wait for this one to be finished. I'm going to start executing that one that I guessed. If I'm right, well, we saved a lot of time. If I'm wrong, well, I throw the what I've done away and I'll start over. And that's what it's called, it's called a bubble in the pipeline. And so when you're right, you know, you get maximum throughput from your CPUs. It's actually doing 10 times as many instructions as otherwise, and when you're wrong, well, you know, you lose that many cycles of having to start over. So the main idea of vectorized execution is because you organize data one column at a time instead of one row at a time, when you evaluate an expression and when you do something, you treat all the values for one column at a time, which means you're, doing, you're going to do the same, exact same instruction or a small set of instruction in a tight loop that's going to do the same thing over and over with no virtual calls, what you want to avoid, like typically where you have an expression you're evaluating, you're doing A plus B plus C divided by D, you know, something else. Um, each of the plus or divided, it's actually an eval method, right, with a virtual call, which means that sometimes you do plus for the same call, sometimes you do divided, and like the branch predictor is actually not that smart, right, and so it's going to be wrong all the time, and you get like, terrible performance. But if you do the exact same thing, if you, let's say, let's do all the A plus B first, and so what you're going to do, you're going to do A plus B in a tight loop, which is always, always, always the same thing, 
And the branch prediction is going to be always right. Yeah, we're just doing the same loop again, yeah. Uh, except for the last time, oh, the loop is finished. I was wrong, but you know, it's negligible across the 60,000 execution you just did. So that's where vectorized execution is a lot more efficient because it avoids a lot of bubbles and can get the most throughput of the CPU. So that's the main idea behind vectorized execution and keeping data in, in columns. Another aspect is um, <coughs> CPU cache. So, you know, memory is in your RAM, your main memory, and the CPU is separate, and the CPU can go really fast, but um, it's going much faster than getting data across the bus. So, to resolve that, just like CPUs have a branch predictor to kind of cheat and go faster than they should, they have memory cache on the CPU that is much faster to access, but much smaller. So they will keep memory around, data around that they're just working on. And that goes much faster. But the trick is, of course, it's much smaller. So if you're accessing a lot of data that is in different place, there's a lot of cache thrashing, right? You keep accessing data that's somewhere else, and you keep sending data on and off the cache, right? And you wait, same thing, the CPU will wait every time. I'm depending on this data, it's not in my cache, I need to wait for it to arrive, it takes many cycles, and then I can work on it. So in the vectorized execution mode, because your working set is much smaller, and you work on one column at a time, you can be a lot more efficient, because instead of having a, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C for all the columns, and then you read A, and then you read the other A, and then you read the other A, you have more data in it that you may not be using right away, and you can put less of your working set in your cache. If you're working on all the A and Bs and they're together, then you can be a lot faster because you're going to load only those things in your cache and the cache will be more efficient, right? And you, do, you have more cache locality and you do less of going back and forth uh, on the bus with the CPU. And um, <clears throat> so that's just summarizing cache locality. Uh, the other thing I haven't mentioned is modern CPUs now have CMD instruction. So it stands for um, single instruction, multiple data. And you can tell the CPU, hey, instead of doing A plus B, here are four A's, here are four B's, do A plus B on all those four values and store those four results in this place. So you get actually four times the throughput. And that's actually, it works only if you have the, uh, columnar data representation, right? You put all the data next to each other in memory and you're telling the CPU do the exact same instruction four times. So in one cycle, it's, doing, it's going to do four pluses. And you get more of this. So it's another trick that modern CPUs do to go faster. And that is enabled by uh, vectorized execution. Okay. <clears throat> so those are more details about how it's represented. And I'll go a little faster in it in, on this part because um, I've been a little uh, too slow on the first part. But so it's more about details of how the representation is. And so, you know, you start with the schema negotiation. Here's the schema, it's going to tell you what colon exists, what vector exists. And then when you treat the data, it's split in record batches, right? Because usually you don't need, you won't, don't want to fit all the data set in memory. You can have one chunk at a time, and then you have all those batches that can be received one after another that all have the same schema. So if you look at it, if you have this um, JSON example right there, it has three column, name, age, phones. So we can look at age first because it's a fixed width uh, type. And for simplicity, I don't uh, represent nulls in this example. Nulls are represented with a bit set, right? One bit uh, per value. And so if it's fixed width types, you see here, um, you know, it's just a vector and you have that number of bytes for each value and you have direct access per the of index of the value. <coughs> the age for the first record is the first value, the age for the second record is the second value. And it's fixed width, so it's easy random access. It's a variable when length like name, name is a string, it's a variable length and you have a vector for the offset and each value is a starting offset of the string, and the next value is, is the end offset, right? A starting offset of the next string. That's why it has an extra value that points at the end, 
is just a simplification so that in the code you can always assume that the next value points to the end of your string. So there's always an extra offset, which is where would start the next value if there was one. And uh, if you have a list, basically you can reuse, this is composable, right? For storing list, it's the same mechanism as storing uh, variable width types. Uh, basically, we have an offset vector uh, that points. So this is composable, right? You can make a list of lists of lists of lists. You just add more offset vectors. And um, you can access any value in constant time. I mean, it's constant uh, to the schema. It's dependent on the depth of the schema. It's proportional to the depth of the schema because you will have one lookup per list in your schema, but it's basically a constant time uh, for um, otherwise. And so when you send the record uh, on the wire, on the network, you would put the data header that tells you, hey, here's the buffers, here are the lengths, and they just sent one after each other on the wire, which means you can just tell the uh, network level to say, hey, copy those buffers to the wire, and that's all there is. There's no extra transformation. And so in RPC, to avoid serialization, deserialization, so all the overhead, which can be quite important, of serialization, deserialization is gone. And uh, for internal process communication, you can share this data, you can remove entirely the copy as well. Because since you're creating an immutable record batch, right? Once you finish writing a record batch, you can say it's immutable. You can share it uh, as read-only memory. And, um, <clears throat> and then um, the next process can read it and produce a new record batch. So there's also a memory management component because it's all in memory. So it's just being able to define quotas and saying, like keeping track of what part of the code is using how much memory. Little view of uh, language bindings. So Parquet has Java, CPP, Python, Pandas integration, Arrow, as well as uh, Wes mentioned the R integration. Um, maybe it's more. Uh, I put it underway here, but I think it's uh, pretty advanced. Uh, Parquet and Gene integration, there are a lot of things that support Parquet. Uh, for Arrow, which is newer, uh, Apache Drill is a query engine that supports it. Pandas are um, support it. There's some work being done to integrate with Spark. And one of the holy grail is, you know, when you have PySpark, is to have the zero overhead interaction between uh, PySpark and um, Arrow. And so some examples on how that work. So if you want distributed execution, that's an example of how you do a sum from something grouped by something else. And so you know the way it works in a distributed way, you do partial aggregations, and then um, it's consistently hashed to send you know the same keys to the same machine. And then once you've done your partial aggregation, you send them over, finish your aggregation, send it to the user. And so the main key, the key here is once you finish writing your partial arg, there's no serialization, deserialization involved. It's just plain copy to the next one. And same thing for collecting the data to the user. And because it's, it's column oriented, you can do all the vectorized, much more efficient processing. And so in the Python use case, uh, like you can imagine, like let's say you have a SQL engine and you want to use your Python UDFs. UDF standing for user defined function. Um, <clears throat> so, right now, same use case for PySpark. Is there some deserialization, deserialization involved? Uh, so, with this, because we're using the exact representation and because it is the efficient representation for vectorized execution of the query engine, it can just, uh, the query engine materialize input to the functions. It will share that memory. Let's say you have a Java query engine like Spark SQL or Drill. You can share this memory with a Python project, pro, uh, <coughs> Python pro process. Python process will read the input, produce the output as an immutable data structure, and that can be read by the next operator. And um, <coughs> that's a lot more efficient. There's no overhead, there's no copy, there's no serialization, deserialization. There's no copy because the data is just shared in memory in between processes. And because it's immutable, there's no problem with sharing it. You can even share it with multiple processes. There's no modification in the, in happening. <coughs> so 
Now, just a little bit of summarization. This is a typical, what are the latencies? You know, you've seen that slide before, I'm sure. And you can see the cache, uh, CPU cache, and you have multiple level of caching, branch misprediction, main memory reference. Um, and then in the future thing that you could start hap seeing happening is uh, NVMe, which is non-volatile memory. And when we talk about non-volatile memory, it's basically flash uh, inside of uh, your memory um, um, slots. And it's not, for us, it's not really that it's uh, um, persistent storage that's important. But it's more that it's a layer, it's cheaper than regular memory, and you can get a lot more for the same price, and it's not too much lower. So it's lower than regular memory, but it's cheaper. So it's just like some kind of different trade-off. Because remember, all those query engines, they're trying to do as much as possible in memory because it's faster. But when it doesn't fit in memory, then they have to spill to disk and fall back to disk. And so as long as your data set fits in memory, it's really fast. And then it doesn't fit anymore, then it becomes really slow. So the main idea is to say, hey, those are new technologies that get in the middle and then enable more options, right? Instead of falling from very really fast to really slow. We have some other options in the middle when you can put a lot more data in it. It's slower than main memory, but it's much faster than disk. <clears throat> so that's what non-volatile memory is about. 3D, X point, uh, cross point is um, the Intel uh, new flash drive. It's like very fast flash drives. So it's like another in between. Uh, RDMA is remote um, direct memory read. And that's um, like you have new technologies coming which enables you to read memory from a remote machines without going through its CPU. So you can say, I want to read this data from this memory, and you don't use its CPU at all. So you can see in those immutable data structures, that's very interesting. Because as soon as if the host machine shares information of where certain data sets are located, Another machines can read it remotely and doing scans and doing other operation with limited uh, load on the host memory, uh, on the, sorry, on the host CPU, um, and then enables, so that's future, right? That's the kind of stuff that's coming in terms of technologies, and that will enable uh, those clusters uh, working in re reducing the use of the CPU and freeing it for other things. And of course, at the bottom, you have spinning disk uh, so SSDs and spinning disk, and you kind of see like what we, we're trying to do. You have a lot of um, trade-offs and compromise you can do between all those things. <clears throat> so sorry, I'm running a little over time, so I'm going to skip those examples. It's just you know similar idea how you extract data from HBase, Cassandra, uh, Kudu using Arrow and making it a lot more efficient. Just for the short story, currently Kudu when it, you, Kudu can do a projection push down, filter push down very well, and then it presents rows. It will assemble rows on the server side and send them to the client, because typically current clients are raw oriented. But when you present it the drill integration, for example, right now, it will ask Kudu do the push downs for projection filtering. It will get those rows, and then it will convert them back in, uh, in column representation. So once we have the error integration, Kudu can materialize Euro columns, send them on over the wires, and first, Kudu will be much more efficient at generating columns and rows because Kudu is column oriented, so it can do the vectorized way of generating those columns, which is going to be much faster than assembling rows and doing a lot of back and forth in memory. And second, then on the client side, Drill will just work directly from those columns because it's already its internal representation for data. So you skip a lot of CPU loss doing conversions from one format to the other because we lack of this standard in-memory uh, format for analytics. So this is all happening. So we had the step where the format is defined and you know it's available in C++, in Java, and starts being integrated in various things at different rates. Um, so you start seeing it uh, more and more available in various things, and you're welcome to contribute as well or to push your favorite open source project to uh, uh, adopt it faster. <clears throat> and sim similar thing, you could do an uh, in-memory cache based on that. This is an illustration of the tiering. You know, like I was saying, you try to work out of memory because it's much faster, 
when it doesn't work, we fall back to disk, and data is stored in disk, like in parquet format, for example. And non-volatile memory can, is a trade-off when you can you know, have something in between so that you don't have all the performance. Uh, it's not like either fast or slow. Uh, you can have a more range for different, dif for different uh, use cases. And you know, like throughput goes up, cost goes down, and it's kind of like the future, like you see more and more SSDs uh, or, um, or NVMe, which is basically, you know, splash in your DIM. It's not DIM anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> so as I said, uh, we have support for um, the Parquet uh, C++ and Error C++. Parquet C++ um, have integration with Python and they have a flat uh, integration, so we need support for nested data structures. Uh, we're working on IPC implementation, which is defining what's the protocol for sharing that, for having this read-only shared memory. Um, you know, things, um, Kudu integration, um, adding this uh, Python UDF use case, uh, which will be enabled by IPC, so working on having this better PySpark integration, when you can like uh, Wes presented, if you've seen the Python presentation from Wes, uh, you can use um, Euro uh, data frame in Pandas, so you can write Pandas functions that you can use in um, PySpark, but removing all the overhead of serializing, deserializing when going from Spark to Python. So now it's going to be much faster because right now data scientists, they use Python and it's really fast. You can use Pandas, you can do really fast things, and then when you move to distributed mode, then it goes a lot slower because you have all the overhead of serialization, deserialization, sending over the network. And so it's about removing all this overhead and making it a lot faster. Right. And so if you want to join the community, learn more about it, you have a mailing list for Arrow and Parquet Apache project. There's a Slack for Arrow. So this URL you know, slides you need to be invited. So this URL enables you to put your emails to get auto-invited and join the uh, Aero Slack, the Apache uh, project URL, and we're on Twitter as well. You can follow, tweet, um, and stuff. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs>